Uh, the final presentation today is uh, by a member of the World Bank Group. They're presenting their Women in Business and the Law Report for this year. This report measures, its yearly report, measures how laws, regulations, and institutions differentiate between women and men in ways that affect uh, women's incentives or capacity to work or to set up and run their own businesses. It provides data on legal and regulatory barriers to women's entrepreneurship and employment in 173 economies over seven, several, seven areas, accessing institutions, using property, getting a job, uh, providing incentives for work, building credit, going to court to protect women from violence, and others. This year's report marks the fourth edition of this Women, Business, and the Law Report series. And here to present is Tazim Hassan. She joined Women, Business, and the Law in 2014. Prior to that, she was a legal specialist for several other World Bank reports. And um, prior to joining the World Bank Group, she practiced as a barrister in the UK, specializing in civil and commercial law, and subsequently worked in Kenya as a legal advisor at NGOs. She obtained a master's in international law from the London School of Economics and a BA in law from Pembroke College from the University of Oxford. She's fluent in Urdu, Hindi, and French. Thank you very much, Sidney. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, it's a, a pleasure to be here. And I've had the benefit of um, listening to several of the other panels, and they've been wonderful panelists and a really interesting discussion. Um, so I'd like to describe a little bit of what we do, and, and it really ties into some of the issues that have been discussed uh, earlier on, the gender wage gap, access to credit, fiscal policies, and this is looking at it on a, on a global level. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next slide. It's actually a short film, and it, so forgive me if I manage to kind of uh, mess this up because technology is not my strongest point, but I'm going to try and get this uh, film to play. Okay. Women are disadvantaged around the world. When it comes to getting a job or starting a business, women face more legal barriers than men. The World Bank monitors these barriers around the world, and the results may shock you. In 100 economies, women are prohibited from many jobs. In 18 economies, husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. In 46 economies, there are no laws protecting women from domestic violence. When there is discrimination, Fewer women work or own businesses. This affects women. It also affects their children because there is less money for education, health, and food. And it affects their countries by stunting economic growth. One small change in the law can have a big ripple effect. For example, when women have equal rights to property, they can use it to get a loan and start a business. When there are more businesses, more jobs are created. So um, let me just give you a little bit of background on our program. Uh, we're a group of lawyers at the World Bank uh, Group, and, and we uh, publish a report in, in fact every two years. And uh, we have we look at uh, data, uh, data, legal data on how on what uh, what we think would uh, will impact women's entrepreneurship opportunities and their ability to get a job and start a business. And we look at different laws. Some laws are an out. Uh, basically outrightly discriminatory, but some laws are, are gender neutral, but they disproportionately impact women. And um, so this project has been in existence since 2009, and uh, we've been now kind of as a, uh, uh, we are now at 173 uh, countries that we cover, <coughs> and we'll soon be at 189 countries. And we look at, um, as I say, uh, a whole array of laws, and uh, I've mentioned uh, 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 some of these uh, types of laws, and, um, and we look under seven indicators. So for instance, we look at uh, accessing institutions, so women's ability 
for instance, to be head of household um, using property, um, and th that area kind of covers things like inheritance rights and whether women control um, can, uh, and, and the laws of property within marriage. Uh, we look at labor laws, so restrictions on women's work um, and whether they're entitled to kind of paternity leave and maternity leave. We look at, um, uh, for instance, incentives to work. So that kind of covers the fiscal space. So for instance, whether there are, there are tax incentives, um, s such as uh, uh, deductions for childcare, um, and, uh, and these kind of issues that have already been raised today. And we also look at uh, building credit, um, and, uh, for ins uh, and whether credit bureaus cover women's credit history, which was um, a really, um, as we heard in the last panel, a very important issue because women have, very, have uh, less access to credit. A lot of research has shown that. And many of the difficulties lie in being able to prove their cr uh, credit history and also um, having collateral in terms of loans. We look at, um, for instance, the ability to access courts in the judicial system. And we have now expanded into gender violence. And, um, and what's... Uh, and we're looking at laws on domestic violence, on sexual harassment, and these kind of areas. And um, what we do is we look at all of this holistically and make the link to women's economic empowerment. Because you may not think that, for instance, gender violence is related but, um, to, to these issues, but they are fundamentally because it prevents women from uh, being able to uh, function uh, effectively in the workplace or, or to start a business. And uh, there has been research showing, for instance, how that impacts women's uh, uh, income levels in, in countries and, and their productivity. And what we have shown is that out of these um, uh, laws that we cover, that, um, and the 173 uh, countries that we cover, at least 90% of countries have one law that is discriminatory that is on the books. And, um, and so, it, it, it's still very much a, a prevalent problem uh, globally and uh, in countries that would uh, surprise you as well. And so if we dig deeper as to the types of laws that we're looking at, um, so for instance, uh, women can't travel outside of the country in the same way as uh, husbands in six countries across the world. Uh, married women need permission uh, to travel outside of the home in 17 countries across the world. Uh, married women uh, can't apply for a passport in the same way as their husbands in 32 economies across the world. Uh, married women can't pass citizenship to their children in the same way as their fathers can do in 22 <coughs> economies across the world. And married women cannot pass citizenship to their spouses as married men can in 44 economies across the world. And actually, that kind of brings a uh, um, an important point that a lot of these restrictions trigger on marriage, um, that these same restrictions don't apply to unmarried women, but as soon as you get married, um, you suddenly have to get permissions from your husband to be able to do very basic acts um, that, uh, that can stop you um, to, uh, from really uh, effectively operating uh, in, in society. And, and this um, uh, slide will show you some of the examples. So for instance, um, uh, in Afghanistan, women can't uh, need to get their husband's permission to, to uh, travel outside of the home. And um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, they, uh, and this is, in, I, I'm, I'm actually working uh, in um, as a World Bank project that is uh, supporting the reform of the family code in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that family code is, um, under that family code, married women can't open a bank account, they can't get a loan, they can't sign a contract, um, they can't go to court, uh, they uh, can't register a company, they can't register a business uh, without the permission of their husband. And it's a very old family code, it was a Belgian family code, and it still operates. And I was in Kinshasa a few uh, uh, um, uh, months ago and uh, went to see uh, the company registry, and there there was a letter that said uh, that uh, uh, I also see the file of a married woman, and there was actually a letter there on file um, saying that I, I give my, uh, I, Monsieur so and so, give my wife uh, permission to register her company. And so these laws can actually be implemented, and uh, they are implemented. And what's also interesting is that these are kind of old colonial codes. 
um, that, for instance, uh, that have been on the books for a long time, I mean, since independence, but they've been reformed. So this Belgian code had been reformed in Belgium. And um, we've done a historical study of legal rights, of women's legal property rights, over 50 years, from, from 1960 to 2010, for 100 co countries. And so what's been interesting, actually, is that these rights existed um, in, in Europe, uh, in, for instance, in uh, Spain up till 1978, and in Switzerland, up to 1984, uh, married women needed permission to work outside of the home. So they've only um, been recently, relatively recently reformed <coughs> in Europe. And these uh, old family codes carry on in, in uh, other parts of the world. And so we measure the number of legal uh, gender differences by economy. So there's a whole graph that's uh, probably a little bit too fine print to see it here, but you can see it in our report. Um, and all of this is open access data. Um, it's available on our website, and you can download it. And it, uh, it's interesting to kind of um, to be able to look and see how your own country is doing in comparison to the other countries. And so it acts as an incentive to reform. And um, one of the ways that, um, that uh, we hope that the data is being used is is as an advocacy tool uh, for reform and. Um, uh, and so from uh, our perspective, it's important to show that legal reform is actually smart economics. Um, and it makes economic sense for the governments to reform these laws. And we do that by, for instance, showing um, that if, um, that where those kind of discriminatory laws are on the books, they can decrease female labor force participation and they can undermine um, income per capita and GDP growth and that legal um, gender equality is associated with much lower female um, uh, labor force participation, and that um, those uh, laws don't actually uh, impact men as significantly, or um, they impact women uh, disproportionately. And there's been research um, recently by the IMF and also um, uh, showing that um, how these uh, uh, gaps in labor force participation actually lead to income losses for the country, up to 27% in the Middle East and North Africa, 90% in South Asia, and 14% uh, in Latin America, and 10% in Europe. And these figures are important because often um, the kind of work that we do, we go and talk to ministers of finance within countries and say, well, look, you know, these laws have a real economic impact for the whole of the country, and it's not just a woman's issue. And um, and uh, there was a recent, um, well, uh, now not so recent, but 2012 report, World Development Report on, on gender, which I was involved in. And uh, again, showing basically if you had, uh, that if you had more women uh, in, in the workforce, you could increase labor productivity as much as 25% uh, in certain economies. And uh, one of the key findings from uh, this uh, year's report is that uh, lower legal gender, gender equality is associated with fewer girls attending secondary school, fewer women working or running a business, and a wider gender wage gap. And, uh, and again, we've used our data and correlated it, linked it to other sources of data to show that there are these kind of significant uh, impacts on society. And so what's the benefit of reform? And again, um, uh, uh, we, we, uh, there's been research done in this area. And uh, I'm just going to highlight three kind of examples. So for instance, um, in Ethiopia, uh, they reformed the family code. And previously, their, um, women needed, again, their husband's permission to work. And men controlled the marital property. And so this family code was reformed. And it, uh, the research showed that, um, that basically by reforming the law, that you had more higher female labor force participation and in more productive sectors, and, uh, and they were also working full time, uh, uh, women. So again, um, it's, it's to show how, how this uh, reform matters. Um, there was another reform in, in India, uh, and this involved the inheritance laws. And previously, uh, unmarried daughters couldn't inherit an ancestral land, and that uh, legislation was reformed. And just by reforming that law, um, they showed that basically, again, research showed that uh, 
Uh, first of all, there was more investment in girls' education. Um, there was a delayed age of marriage for girls. And, that, uh, and then a few years down the line, they did more uh, uh, kind of re uh, research showing the second generation effects. Um, let's, um, that meaning a few more, few more years uh, later, and, and that showed that, for instance, um, there were more wi women uh, uh, having bank accounts, uh, that the women who had benefited from the inheritance law reform were investing more in their daughter's education, and also had sanitation consequences, that uh, uh, women basically were able to um, uh, invest in uh, sanitary latrines for the household. And that, this actually reflects uh, the pattern in the US when voting rights were first given to women. And it showed that basically one, uh, one, just, uh, just within um, a, a year of uh, women gaining voting rights, uh, that spending patterns shifted to incorporate uh, a lot more spending on public health. And uh, there was a great increased uh, campaigning around these issues on hygiene, and that led to a reduction in uh, childhood, uh, childhood uh, infectious diseases and maternal mortality as well. So again, uh, when you're dealing with this at a policy level, it's really important to kind of show that these reforms have consequences beyond just women, but can affect society as, as a whole. And so um, one area that we look at is uh, women's access to jobs. And so, for example, uh, we look at kind of areas um, uh, the, where women are not able to work, and these restrictions can be uh, quite high. Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, we look at uh, um, whether women are, pro what, uh, whether certain industries that women are prohibited from working on, restrictions in working hours, and uh, whether they can, um, uh, whether they can work um, uh, during the day or during the, uh, during the night. And we found that, for instance, 100, um, out of a, 100 out of the 173 economies still have some kind of restrictions that prevent women from pursuing the same kind of jobs and economic activities as men. And so this gives you kind of an example as to the type of restrictions um, that women face. And uh, for instance, in uh, Russia, women are prevented from doing 456 jobs, types of jobs that men can do. And this is the current uh, law. They can't, uh, they can't uh, do uh, drive a truck, uh, they can't do woodwork, um, uh, very basic activities. And the reason historically for this was that it was done, designed to protect women um, because these jobs were considered to be dangerous in some way. But, um, well, technology has moved on, social norms have moved on, and those jobs are no longer um, as um, dangerous, but the restrictions still are there in place. And um, so, for instance, in um, 2009, uh, a woman uh, challenged uh, these restrictions. She wanted to become a, a, a subway driver uh, on the metro. And, um, and the law as it stands says, no, no she can't do this. And so she channeled, uh, challenged this decision. And what happened was that the um, Supreme Court of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Russia said, nope, sorry, still uh, we can't overturn this restriction. It's still too dangerous. Uh, and so the restriction still stands. And the argument is that, well, if it's dangerous for a woman, it should be dangerous for a man. I mean, there's not really any difference in that sense. So the whole policy should be to make it equally safe for both men and women. And also, um, the, the fact is that the technology is such that it is much safer than it was a number of years ago. And so um, that's one kind of example. I mean, another example that you see there is France, uh, where women can't carry loads of more than 25 kilograms, um, at, um, as, and that's still in force. But there's actually no law in force that says that women can't pick up their five-year-old son or daughter, right? Uh, I mean, they still kind of, you know, it's about the same weight. So it, these are quite outdated laws, and uh, they actually lead to occupational segregation. Um, so 
uh, because women tend then not to be able to go into industries that are lucrative. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, for instance, there are kind of many restrictions in the oil and mining industry. And so, um, and recently I heard um, we, um, there was a project um, that was being done in Kyrgyzstan and there women were not allowed to be bus drivers. Uh, and, and the trouble was that a bus driver earned $180 a month and uh, women um, were congregated mostly in the education sector, they were earning $90 a month. And, uh, and the bus driver, I mean, uh, the hours were much better. The woman could take two days off as well. They had flexible working schedules. And so the whole point was that this was leading to a greater gender wage gap. And so the law was uh, ultimately reformed. Um, but these things can really, um, really cement um, these uh, gaps when it comes to pay. And so basically we, what we found, one of our key findings is that the gender wage gap is likely to be uh, smaller when there are no restrictions on women's work. Um, uh, so the less restrictions there, there are, um, the gender wage be uh, gap becomes much, much smaller. Um, another area uh, that we look at is uh, maternity leave and paternity leave and parental leave. And again, um, this is an area that's quite important because uh, the fact is that uh, these allow women to enter the workforce and stay in the workforce. Um, you often find that, for instance, women drop out uh, just because there is inadequate leave and the, the majority of the um, care is done by women. Um, so we found, for instance, that, uh, where, that maternity leave is, is very common, 167 countries out of the 173 mandate uh, maternity leave but only uh, 53 countries uh, provide for any form of parental leave. And, uh, and the whole uh, structure of this should be that both men and women should be able to take care of their families. And, um, and by placing the burden exclusively on women, it means that, for uh, that again, it can lead to that gender wage gap, that women are, are, are prevented from taking advantage of economic opportunities because they have to drop out of the workplace for a, a longer period of time. Now, who pays uh, for these uh, maternity and paternity leaves are also important um, because, uh, for instance, it can be a, a disincentive if, for employers um, if, if, if the burden of paying for this type of leave is exclusively on, on them uh, and th there will be a reluctance to hire women. And so what we have found, for instance, uh, is that where there's more public um, support for uh, childcare, um, that, uh, that this actually can um, lead to it, for instance, for more women to enter into the workforce. And so, there's a, so uh, that they're more likely to receive wages when the government um, uh, um, is subsidizing childcare in some uh, uh, form. And the reason, again, is that uh, basically it makes childcare affordable, it makes um, uh, employers more uh, uh, incentivized to hire women, and the burden is not exclusively uh, on, on the private sector to subsidize this. Um, and so these kind of structural issues, the infrastructure around childcare, is, is, is very important. And so it's not just the provision of childcare, but it's also um, how it's set up between um, partners, uh, but between the um, spouses and, hus uh, and also who actually pays for it, that's actually going to, and, and, and really fine tuning that system means that it will actually work um, to, uh, to, to, to everyone's advantage. Uh, we also look at uh, women's access to credit. And, um, and uh, again, um, uh, many of the issues that we look at are interlinked. So when we look at property laws, um, that has a down the line effect on access to credit. Women need uh, basic property such as uh, land uh, to, which can serve as collateral immovable property. 
And so one side of the equation is, is all that area of, uh, of, of uh, property and assets. But um, also, uh, there is um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, possibility of discrimination when it comes to accessing uh, credit as well. And so, for instance, uh, we look as part of our data on uh, whether there are laws that prevent discrimination when it comes to providing financial services. And so uh, there are specific uh, points of legislation. Uh, we have found, for instance, that uh, 46 economies across the world, so 46 out of the 173, require non-discrimination on grounds of uh, gender in access to credit. And so there are some interesting examples of this kind of legislation. Uh, the U.S. led the way um, in, not, uh, in terms of legislation uh, by having the Equal Qu uh, Credit Opportunities Act of 1974. And so that law specifically prohibits discrimination based on sex and marital status with, um, when it comes to any kind of credit transaction. And there's an interesting backstory to this. Um, the, the, um, uh, this, uh, um, the gender aspect was completely overlooked until this uh, lady, uh, Lindy Boggs, uh, who was a representative, uh, said, uh, insisted that it should be uh, put into the legislation. It was only by her last minute intervention that it did get passed. And she herself was, had got into the House of Representatives um, because her husband had died and, as a, and she'd kind of, she, she had basically taken over his, uh, his seat. And so it's one of those kind of accidents of history that uh, you get some momentous legislation uh, like this that kind of uh, can act as a, 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 a model for, for other countries. Um, the other, um, uh, other examples are the Australian Sex Discrimination Act, um, and there's also um, uh, 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 kind of credit programs that can also ha help as well. So um, we have, for instance, um, so 46 countries do prohibit uh, discrimination on terms of gender, and out of those 46 countries, 34 uh, prohibit discrimination specifically on the grounds of marital status. But it's still a minority of the countries, and it's an important area to look at when it comes to looking at uh, financial services. Um, so this chart gives you uh, an overview as to which of the countries there are around across uh, regions that uh, have this kind of legislation. Um, the data is, as I say, all in our report and it can be downloaded. You can fiddle around with a website to kind of get what kind of data you want by the kind of question that you're looking at and by the countries. Uh, but this just gives you a kind of flavor. Uh, another area that we're looking at is for, an, um, and again, it kind of goes really full circle back to uh, being able to access credit is women's ability to get um, documentation, uh, very basic documentation that would enable them to then get, uh, open a bank account, get loans. And, um, and, uh, and it's what I call really uh, formal identity. So it's, it's to, uh, women's ability to get uh, birth certificates and national ID cards. And uh, we, and, um, and, and still in some, uh, countries, and in fact, in um, 10 countries across the world, women do need, uh, have much more stringent requirements when it comes to just getting a, an ID card. They require additional documentation. And again, this can prevent women from um, being able to, to access be uh, better services. So for instance, we found here that women are half as likely to borrow from a financial institution where the process are, processes are more difficult for women. Um, and, uh, and also, for instance, another factor that comes into play is that uh, uh, there are these uh, uh, family codes where the husband is the head of household and he actually controls property within the marriage as well, and that's actually in legislation. And that kind of uh, uh, um, legislation is also means that women are less likely to have a, a bank account, and that's another key finding from our report. Um, and so, uh, these are kind of issues um, that uh, are, are, are still very much there on the books and, uh, and can really um, hamper women uh, in terms of uh, 
just uh, financial inclusion, access to credit, just very basic uh, uh, activities. Now, if we turn to the U.S., well, there aren't any uh, provisions that uh, where married women need permission to, to from their husbands anymore, um, uh, and so that's uh, obviously kind of uh, an area that's uh, not in play. But I think one one area where uh, the U.S. Uh, still is um, not uh, doing well on is is maternity leave, and uh, certainly it's one of the few countries in the world where there's no paid maternity leave. Um, so. Generally, uh, the other constant, uh, provisions are, 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 are good, uh, that, that, that there are no restrictions on women's jobs, um, and there's certainly no uh, laws um, that mandate, uh, for instance, non-discrimination based uh, uh, in hi uh, on g gender and hiring. Um, and so uh, this is just a snapshot of the data that you'll find on our website. But uh, you know, the, the, the real gap is maternity leave. Now, if we take a more of a global uh, look, we, uh, we've, what we've done here is to say, well, um, what are the issues that impact on women's economic entrepreneurship? And we've constructed a, a heat map around those. So for instance, um, we've looked uh, at the issues of uh, legal identity, we've looked at the issues of women's ability to get a, a, a passport and ID cards, their ability to travel, their ability to choose where to live, so mobility issues, um, the protection from harassment in public places. And we've looked at uh, legal capacity, um, for instance, whether they can sign contracts, register businesses, um, open a bank account. We've looked at their assets, so the ability to be able to, uh, to inherit, and we looked at access to credit. And we've basically created what we'd say hotspots where um, uh, these legal frameworks are strong and there's legal uh, or where they're weak. And so uh, just to give you an idea of the countries um, where um, if we take all these ty types of criteria where they're weak, um, they are uh, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Congo, De the Democratic Republic of Congo, Cameroon, uh, Senegal, uh, Within those, so you can basically look at the map and, and see where they're particularly we, uh, weak. Where they're strong, um, uh, you've got countries like uh, Australia, Austria, uh, Germany, uh, on this index, uh, the UK, US. And what's actually interesting about these um, uh, indicators, there are only 18 uh, economies that have no late legal gender differences across the world. Um, and they include what you would normally think of uh, as countries um, with no, uh, New Zealand, Canada, um, and the Netherlands, but they also include countries that you wouldn't expect to be on that list, um, uh, Peru, Namibia, and South Africa, for instance. So it's not really a case of economics, uh, economic <laughs> development, that you can uh, achieve legal equality, um, and it's not dependent on the pathway of development as such. And um, just a quick overview as to which countries have reformed, and um, it's a positive trend generally. Um, uh, there's been a great deal of reform in ECA, uh, which is Eastern and Central uh, uh, Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, there is a movement um, towards reform, and most of these have been in the area of labor laws and, and gender violence laws, in fact. Um, so we, we track that as well. And um, over the last two year cycle, We've seen um, reforms in the whole list of, uh, of, of our, the areas that we cover. And so the 65 countries carry out 94 reforms. And these are the kind of examples of the kind of uh, 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 reforms that were made. And uh, if I give a specific, um, if we look at the types of reforms, for instance, we see that um, South Africa uh, reformed its law to provide equal uh, pay for equal work. Uh, Tajikistan introduced uh, public childcare services. So I mean, it's a whole range of reform. Um, and um, not on this list, uh, but uh, Belarus had 252 restrictions um, where, where, uh, on the types of jobs that women could do. And now they've reduced that to 182, um, which is 
a step in the right direction, but not kind of completely there yet. So it's, uh, we're hoping by the next report uh, that they might reduce it to zero. So uh, it, it really is a benchmarking exercise, and uh, it, it uh, and and using this kind of uh, a lens can help uh, track the legal reforms, but also to show that you know these reforms do need to be done, and they still matter for women. So uh, it, I. I urge you all to go to our website, uh, download the data, look at our report, and, 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 and make use of the data. Advocate for these reforms where you can. Thank you. We want to thank especially the World Bank for coming in and giving this very interesting presentation. It was great to hear um, the global perspective for some of the issues that we've been discussing today. And then we wanted to thank all of you for coming to this event. Um, Lily, Sequoia, and I uh, have been working hard on it for about a year, and we're really excited that you came to join us for this year's Law Women Summit. Uh, we'd like to take a quick opportunity to deliver a, a few concluding remarks, and then we invite you to join us for some drink and food. Um, each panel has pointed to indicators showing some of the economic gender inequalities in the United States that persist despite the signs of great improvement. We see these inequalities in the gender pay gaps that we discussed, we see them in the difficulty that women entrepreneurs have accessing capital and in the disp disproportionate caregiving burdens that women shoulder, and also in the reality that women are excluded from many labor protections um, by virtue of the type of work that they do. And we learned today that reforms in fiscal policy and uh, ta the tax code in particular, coupled with reforms, to the regulatory systems in place, both at the federal and then the state and local level, are opportunities that we have to change these dynamics. And we hope that in the 2016 election cycle that's coming in November, that these issues will be on voters' minds. We also hope that our next Congress and our next admi executive administration will take that to heart. As Olivia mentioned, planning and preparing for this event has been an exciting process as many of you know, one that could not have turned out so successful without our amazing speakers and moderators, firstly, enormous support from Sarah Bowman, NYU Hospitality, and generous contributions from NYU's AC ACS and Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, we would like to also give a special thanks to our dedicated summit committee and the Law Women Exec Board for all of their help and especially to Ryan and Jess for their unwavering support this year. Please stay and enjoy the reception.